Good evening, everybody. We will be getting started in just a few moments, just waiting for a few more people to arrive. Good evening again, and we're now going to get started on the fossil fuel free building demonstration program webinar that the Community Development Department and other city departments have organized for this evening. And again on July the 24th. Uh, let me start by going to the next slide to introduce uh, who is in attendance from the city this evening. My name is Suzanne Rasmussen. I'm director of the Environmental and Transportation Planning Division in the Community Development Department. Also here is Nikhil Ned Carney, an energy project planner, Jennifer Ballou, sustainability project planner, and Brad Pillen, energy engagement planner, all in the Community Development Department. And let me start by noting that this meeting is being recorded so that we may um, translated offline after the meeting for people who can access it in different languages. Next slide, please. A quick overview of how you can participate this evening. This meeting is held in a webinar format. So the way you can engage is by asking questions through the question and answer um, feature in the, the webinar. If you have any technical issues, please send an email to jballou at cambridgema.gov. You can see that at the bottom right-hand side of this, this slide. Um, the way you are joining the meeting is with your video and microphone off, and that will stay off for the entirety of the meeting. You can type your written questions or comments in the Zoom Q&A panel. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, it looks like you can see here on the slide, uh, it says Q&A, and you can post your question there. And we will uh, either, if it's an easy question, answer it uh, in writing as we go along in the webinar, or we will read out the questions at the end of this meeting and, and provide answers um, in person. Next slide, please. The agenda for this evening uh, has several elements. Uh, first, a um, section on the background for the fossil fuel free demonstration program uh, as it how it fits into Cambridge's actions to address climate change overall. Then we'll describe the new regulation that is uh, called the Massachusetts fossil fuel free demonstration program and give an overview of the proposed requirements that uh, are part of, of this program. Uh, it is focused on eliminating the use of fossil fuels in new buildings and also in new renovations. And we will give you a overview of the timeline and next steps for 
the city to adopt this new regulation and the opportunities that exist for shaping the regulation uh, with your input. And then finally, as noted, we will um, have a question and, and answer session and try to answer as many questions that you may have. Next slide, please. So first, a little bit about the background of Cambridge addressing climate change. Next slide, please. So the city has for a very long time been committed to taking action on climate change. And we work on climate change in two different ways. Uh, one, to bring our greenhouse gas emissions to zero by the year 2050, which is what this meeting will address. And also to prepare for the inevitable impacts we will be experiencing from climate change. And Cambridge is doing this as part of a larger coalition of, of cities in the Boston area that all have committed to meeting the target for eliminating greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. Next slide, please. In Cambridge, buildings produce the most greenhouse gas emissions. As you can see on the pie chart, buildings are more than 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are produced in Cambridge and transportation represents 10% and waste uh, at only 7%. The building greenhouse gas emissions come from the use of fossil fuel on site in your building and that uh, rep is represented by either using gas, oil, or potentially other forms of fossil fuel and from electricity use. Electricity in our state is getting cleaner each year and utility companies are required to deliver an increasing amount of ele clean electricity every year. And it is expected that the, the grid that delivers electricity will be mostly renewable as soon as 2030. Next slide, please. Cambridge has developed a long range plan. We call it the net zero action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. And that plan was first adopted in 2015 and was recently updated through a process that involved uh, many community stakeholders, the city council and others um, just uh, late 2021, so very recently. That plan identifies all of the policies and programs that are being recommended to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions and allow us to get to uh, no emissions from buildings by the year 2050. Next slide, please. The, the Net Zero Action Plan as I said, has a, a range of different actions and it is focused on emissions, both from existing and new buildings. And this evening's conversation will primarily focus on new buildings or buildings that are being very substantially renovated. And um, as you can see here, this is, a, this is an overview slide from the Net Zero Action Plan. Some of the the elements in the plan are requirements and some have to do with the types of incentives and support that will be provided for building owners to be able to meet these targets. And some things come from uh, what, it, what the, is happening with the energy supply, uh, such as the electricity grid. Next slide, please. Specifically, the sec action 2.1 in the Net Zero Action Plan calls for new buildings to be net zero from, from the start, including actions uh, to have Cambridge advocate to the state to develop a net zero building codes since Mass the state of Massachusetts, not Cambridge, sets the building codes and to adopt uh, such a code as soon as the state makes it possible and eliminate pathways for fossil fuel use in new construction because it's the best opportunity for fully electrifying a building if, it's, if it happens from the beginning. And of course, to monitor the outcomes of, of putting in place these, these requirements. Next slide, please. So uh, 
at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Nikhil Nekarni, who is going to start describing for you the circumstances by which the fossil fuel demonstration came about and what the specific elements of it is. Over to you, yeah, Nikhil. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so, you know, similar to the work you've been doing in Cambridge on identifying how we can get to net zero, uh, Massachusetts has also identified policies and programs to get to net zero by 2050. It's called the 2050 Decarbonization Roadmap. Um, and you know, two elements uh, that are of note in the building section of the decarbonization roadmap are that new construction offers the easiest and most economically attractive way to start decarbonizing the building sector. And that almost all new buildings can be cost effectively, can cost effectively pursue an efficient electric design. So that's a fossil fuel free design uh, that increases occupant comfort and also pays for itself. So as one element of supporting high performance buildings in Massachusetts, uh, the state created uh, last year, the specialized stretch code, uh, which you might've heard of. And the specialized stretch code sets a very high performance standard for new buildings, uh, very high energy efficiency requirements, but it still uh, was designed in a way that um, permitted buildings to use fossil fuels. Um, and nonetheless, Cambridge adopted the specialized stretch code in January 2023 um, by a vote of, of city council. So meeting our targets, our climate targets, means phasing out fossil fuels in new construction. So what this would mean is that new buildings are built without fossil fuel systems. So buildings are built without gas furnaces or gas fired water heaters. And that applies to gas, oil, and other fossil fuel uses that, that would happen inside the building. Uh, several other cities and states in the US, um, you, know, you may have read about these, um, several other cities and states that have climate commitments similar to Cambridge or similar to Massachusetts have passed uh, no new gas uh, requirements for new buildings. So you know, there's the article on DC, um, New York City first enacted a no new gas policy and then uh, New York State did as a whole, uh, San Jose, San Francisco, other cities in the Bay Area, and then um, effectively much of California has a, a no new gas policy. So instead builders are required to install clean all electric systems. Uh, so fossil fuel free means that new buildings will be built using systems like heat pumps for heating, heat pump water heaters to provide hot water for sinks and showers, um, the clean air benefits for you know, the air in general are documented, but um, there are also many scientific studies identifying the benefits to indoor air quality as well. So this also prevents developers of new buildings from installing new gas infrastructure uh, that would have to be removed later on in advance of meeting our, our climate goals to be net zero in 2050. So next, I will uh, move to the section on the Massachusetts Fossil Fuel Free Demonstration Program. So the Massachusetts legislature has authorized 10 communities in Massachusetts to implement fossil fuel free requirements for new construction and major renovation. Uh, so this is part of a, of a larger climate bill that was enacted in 2022. So this state created demonstration program uh, is being led by the Department of Energy Resources and they've developed regulations for the program um, as well as a suggested ordinance um, or what's referred to as a model rule. So Cambridge provided input to DOER, the Department of Energy Resources in developing the regulations this winter. And then final regulations were sent to the legislature uh, in May, uh, effectively you know, creating a final set of regulations as well as uh, a final suggested ordinance for the 10 communities. So Cambridge has been selected to be able to participate in the Massachusetts demonstration program as one of those 10 communities. Uh, the, uh, so, so Cambridge submitted a home rule petition uh, by a vote of city council and uh, voted upon in December, 2021 and submitted to the state in April, 2022. So that makes us a prioritized community. Uh, eligible to participate in this program. 
uh, a city or town must also meet the 10% affordable housing requirement or meet the MBTA community's zoning requirement. Um, and so Cambridge would qualify as 10% uh, of our housing stock is uh, restricted as affordable, um, over 10%, I should say. Um, and I should note that if a prioritized community drops out or is unable to meet the housing requirements, uh, DOAR is uh, likely to select a substitute community. Um, and just for context, both, both Somerville and Boston are um, expected to pursue participation as a substitute community. Uh, the other 10 you can see on the right side, Arlington, Lexington, Brookline, Acton, Concord, Lincoln, Newton, West Tisbury, and Akinna. And um, six of those, uh, as of today, as you know, from what we've learned, have already voted in their town meetings or uh, select boards to move uh, the fossil fuel free requirements forward and, and to adopt them. So the next item in our agenda is to actually understand what fossil fuel free requirements mean for new buildings and for major renovations. So the demonstration program requires new buildings and major renovations to be fossil fuel free. Uh, so again, new buildings are covered by fossil fuel free and then major renovations are covered and defined in the state regulation. Um, that's commonly understood as 50% or more of a building's floor area, so a fairly substantial renovation of a structure. Um, there, in the, in the sidebar there, there's a little bit more information that summarizes the sort of detailed code-based definitions of, of major renovations. So again, 50% of, of, of a building, or if you're adding in a way that you know, doubles a, a building's footprint, um, or adds 1,000 square feet to a, a single or two family house or 20,000 square feet to a non-residential building. Um, it is important to note that the state regulation um, that, the leg uh, that the legislature passed exempted hospitals, medical offices, and laboratories. So those buildings will not be affected uh, by fossil fuel free and, and cannot be affected by Cambridge's adoption of the fossil fuel free demonstration program. So as I mentioned before, the, the demonstration program has a suggested ordinance or as you know, referred to as model rule. And so what that covers is that a building cannot use coal, oil, natural gas, or other fossil fuels in its operation. So this would generally be understood to include things like heating, hot water systems, lighting, cooking, clothes drying, um, and potentially commercial process loads. So restaurants, dry cleaners, manufacturing. Um, a city or town may propose limited exemptions or changes to the model ordinance with justification. So while the while DOER has, DOER has established a model ordinance as suggested language, it is language that the city would have to justify if we chose to make any uh, minor amendments to that. Um, and the model ordinance is based on the specialized building code that I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, and it basically would be structured as a way, uh, structured in a way that the mixed fuel pathways that use fossil fuels in the code, those pathways are eliminated and the all electric pathway in the code is, is the means of complying with the building code going forward. There are two clarifications that DOER has included in the model rule um, to allow gas or propane use for multifamily water heating until 2027, after which point the buildings, multifamily buildings would have to be all electric, including in water heating. Uh, and then it spells out that major renovations, again, those the sort of you know large scale renovations, can install new fossil fuel equipment for heating hot water and cooking, and, and the emphasis there is, is on the installation of new equipment being um, prohibited. Um, and then finally, I'll note that the state will be conducting an evaluation of outcomes. So the city of Cambridge already posts our building permit information on open data. We'll be actively providing that uh, to DOER upon adoption of, of fossil fuel free. Uh, and then DOER will also access energy use in a, a secure way from the utilities uh, so as to evaluate the emissions impacts of going fossil fuel free. 
Um, and so the next item in our agenda is a timeline of um, you know, uh, a timeline of uh, the the program structure at the state level um, and next steps for adopting regulation here in Cambridge. So per state regulation, Cambridge must submit its final application, including the proposed ordinance and the date effective to do DOER by September 1st of this year. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a little bit under eight weeks from now. Uh, failure to do so would, uh, failure to do so by that date would result in elimination from the program. Um, and municipal, municipalities can submit their applications earlier to DOER for feedback. Um, and again, six other communities have, uh, have already moved forward with that process. So we're sharing information about the program with Cambridge residents and building owners. Uh, so there's information at this webinar. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, there's going to be a, a second session um, with similar content but the same presentation effectively on July 24th uh, for folks who can't make it today. Um, we are engaging with building professionals, you know, folks working on new buildings, uh, designers working on major renovations at this week's specialized code webinars. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. there is a specialized code for commercial building presentation that we're um, collaborating with Mass Save on. And then on Wednesday at the same time, there's the residential specialized code presentation also in collaboration with Mass Save. Uh, we've been flyering at community spaces throughout Cambridge. Uh, there have been news items and online information, uh, outreach to resident associations and business associations, um, as well as information to large building owners and building professionals. Uh, you know, again, the architects, the designers, uh, builders who are involved with new buildings and major renovations, uh, you know, the folks working on that in Cambridge. So we want your feedback on how new buildings in Cambridge and, and those major renovations could be fossil fuel free. Um, so in addition to getting feedback and uh, you know, doing some Q&A today, uh, we've created an online survey uh, to gather input from residents and building owners. And that survey covers specific types of buildings that we should focus our research on, um, specific uses or building systems. So, you know, things like a specific type of heating system or um, a specific process load um, that we should further research. Um, it covers how major renovations could be fossil fuel free and other topics that, you know, we should research. Uh, survey responses are due by July 17th uh, to be incorporated into our research. And uh, the the uh, URL for that, you know, there's the short URL. Um, we, uh, it's, you know, bit.ly at FFF updates. Uh, that'll take you to the fossil fuel free web page that um, you may have just seen already and the, and the surveys uh, right near the top of that page. So the next steps uh, for Cambridge are the CDD, the Community Development Department, is working with a research consultant to explore if any changes to the model rule are appropriate. And again, you know, those would need to be justified. Um, and we're doing that by examining the types of buildings that are being built or renovated in Cambridge. Uh, we're understanding any technical limitations to all electric equipment, um, you know, if any should exist for specific building types or end uses. Uh, we're reviewing how the process loads in Cambridge that exist. Uh, could be affected in, you know, in a newly built building or in a major renovation. Um, and we're reviewing input received from that survey to include in the research. So the city council will then discuss the proposed ordinance language at the August 1st ordinance committee meeting uh, and will vote on final language on August 7th. So that concludes the content uh, of our presentation. Um, I'll turn it back over to Suzanne to uh, get us started on the question and answer section of the evening. Thank you, Nikhil. And um, I would just add uh, two quick things. One, uh, Nikhil a couple of times mentioned the term process load. And just so everybody understands what that means, that is 
use of energy that in a building that is not covered by the building code. So sort of an easy example of that is your television or in, in a uh, commercial building, it could be uh, equipment used to manufacture Tootsie Rolls, one of the things we do in Cambridge. So that's, that's just something that we're required to um, address in this. And also I would note that we are working off of the model ordinance that, that Nikhil described and we'll be using that to, to make uh, any proposals for modifications. Um, so that, that was sort of the, the basis that we're starting with. And with, with that, uh, our presentation uh, is complete and we're gonna um, switch into the question and answer part of the meeting. And just to repeat, uh, your video and microphones will stay off, but you can type written questions or comments in the Zoom Q&A panel. Uh, it's at the bottom of your screen and uh, looks like the black box with the little thought bubbles. Uh, and you can use that. And we have a number of uh, questions and comments that are coming in. So um, we'll, we'll just start from, from one end and start addressing them. And um, I think we might, um, we might just go in order right now and then we'll see if we need to start sort of, uh, if, if there are questions that come in that, that address um, answers that we've already given, uh, they will show up in, we, we will give a written, written response to that. <clears throat> So the first question we received was, uh, how will major renovations for campus buildings that are connected to uh, central utility plants or fossil fuel based district energy? So you have one, one power plant and you have a bunch of buildings connected to it. And that is um, one of the things that we're looking at. The model ordinance does not address this. And we're going to be, um, uh, looking at that as part of our technical research and and come up with a proposal for how that might be handled. So that's something that uh, will definitely be discussed at at the August first meeting of the City Council Ordinance Committee. And the second question is uh, with respect to condominiums or individual apartments. If an individual owner has has major work undertaken, does that kick in the ordinance or is it only if 50% of the whole building? Uh, and it notes that a lot of people don't understand this. So uh, Nikhil, maybe I can ask you to speak to that. Sure, um, the, the definition of major renovation is, is really based in the building code um, and it refers to what's called a level three renovation. And the level three renovation, it refers to 50% of a building's floor area being renovated. So it is, it is defined at the building level, not at the unit level. Um, so 50% of a building would need to be undergoing a renovation um, in order to qualify as a major renovation. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, we have a um, comment about um how to avoid the buildings that are being uh, renovated would result in costs being passed on to tenants and the, in the in the comment there's there's an example given of of how uh, a building was renovated and costs were passed along to tenants so the there isn't a part of this ordinance currently that creates a prohibition against building owners that are renovating their, their buildings uh, to, to pass along those uh, costs. And, and of course that is not the case with any building renovation right now. So um, that is something that would, would need to be discussed separately, but that is not something that's in place as part of, of any of these requirements. We have a question, when a natural gas fired hot water heater fails in a multifamily building after 2027, 
can they replace like with like, or do they need to make it all electric? And I'll turn that over to you, Nikhil. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the way the fossil fuel-free demonstration program is set up is that it applies to the, um, the method of construction when a building is newly constructed, um, or again, the, you know, the renovation when a building undergoes a major renovation. It doesn't have um, sort of requirements for that building in operation later on um, or sort of individual equipment. So really, uh, you know, so to this question, so if, uh, if that gas fired water heater were to fail in a multifamily building, um, this program doesn't really affect the installation of individual equipment, right? For, so that uh, multifamily building could install another gas fired water heater, an oil fired water heater for that matter. Um, it's, it's really only applicable to new construction and to a major renovation of a building. Thank you. And the next question is, how does Cambridge intend to monitor a property's proportional use of renewable electricity? And this, this program does not uh, address the type of electricity or the, the proportion that is renewable, uh, specifically related to this ordinance. Uh, I would say in general, because the city buys electricity on behalf of the vast majority of both residents and small businesses and a portion of, of large businesses in Cambridge, um, we directly control um, how much renewable electricity is being consumed in Cambridge through what, what is being provided through, and it's called the Cambridge Community Electricity or the aggregation. So we have a good sense of, of both being able to supply as much renewable electricity as possible and also understanding how much is being used. And, and the, the program um, uh, offering is changing starting in January. So the, the new version of the aggregation will, um, will roll in in early January. And, we are expecting that to have significantly more renewable energy than renewable electricity than is currently the case. So it's it's a unique situation in cities such as Cambridge that have a electricity buying arrangement on behalf of consumers that we have a, a direct understanding of how much is being used. Um, in addition, under the building energy use disclosure ordinance, the amendments that were just adopted for large buildings, we will also have an understanding of the largest buildings and their use of renewable electricity uh, starting in 2026. Okay, next question. Um, given that there is only one city council meeting between now and September 1st, on August 7, how can we ensure that applicants that the application to be in the fossil fuel demonstration program will be approved and submitted by the September 1st deadline. So um, the, sh the short answer to that is that um, by the city council um, voting to participate, um, and that's obviously the, the um, prerogative of the council, um, the council is, is very aware of these deadlines and uh, we didn't note this early on, but the, the deadline is short and was changed by the state. We had expected this to be November 1st and then in uh, just a few weeks ago, it was changed to September 1st. So that's why we're on this very compressed timeline. Um, but there is, the, uh, we submitted a lot of information to the council um, um, two weeks ago the ordinance has been moved to a second reading, which means that um, it is available to be voted on on August 7. And as noted, there is an ordinance committee meeting, which is a committee of the whole meeting. All counselors are members of the ordinance committee. And that takes place on August 1st. Okay, uh, next question. 
when does this take effect and when will residential contractors need to comply? I'll turn that over to you, Nikhil. Uh, and part of our application process to DUER is to specify um, when fossil fuel free would go into effect in Cambridge. Um, among the six other communities that, that have passed, um, I believe a lot of them have structured it so that goes into effect about three months after DOER approves uh, their proposed language. Um, so as part of our application process and, and as part of city council's consideration of the measure, uh, we will be developing the date effective. Thank you. Next question is, are you going to change the heating system in Cambridge Housing Authority too? Um, so again, this, this ordinance will affect buildings that are being constructed uh, new, so entirely new buildings or buildings that are undergoing major renovation. And in general, for, for buildings such as Cambridge Housing Authority buildings that tend to be very large, it would be only if over 50% of the building were going to be renovated. Okay, next question. Uh, are there advantages to being named a prioritized community? And with this increased demand, will Eversource be able to provide us with the electricity we'll need by 2030? So the first question, um, Yes, there is a, a major advantage to being named a prioritized community. Only prioritized communities will be allowed to participate in the demonstration. So as Nikhil mentioned, uh, 10 have been already identified and only if one or more of those are unable to or unwilling to participate can other communities um, become part of the demonstration. So um, we were named prioritized uh, as a result of the action that was taken by the council in late 21 and by the legislature in early 22 to create this option for communities to require fossil fuel free new construction, which is normally something that is done through the building code, which only the state controls. So to be able to do this, you have to be a prioritized community or and uh, you have to become prioritized because one of the initial 10 communities dropped out. The second question, with this increased demand, uh, will we have enough electricity um, for in 2030? So we have had very extensive conversations with Eversource and the city council has had extensive conversations be primarily because of the changes to the the building energy use disclosure ordinance, which only um, affects existing buildings, which use the vast majority of the energy because there are so many more existing buildings than new buildings. So we expect that um, Eversource will take the necessary steps to uh, meet the demand that uh, results from more buildings electrifying in Cambridge and. Um, they are well aware and we've, they have built, built this uh, expectations about greater use of electricity into um, buildings in Cambridge into their projections for what they need uh, for el electricity infrastructure going forward. Um, it is something that in the uh, Bureau amendments is noted that the, the requirements um, will only take effect if Eversource is able to supply the necessary electricity. So that is, that is one of the things that could be discussed as part of this as well. Okay. Um, will the final ordinance include the exemption for large multifamily buildings until January 1st, 2027? it was missing from the draft presented at city council. Um, I'll turn that over to you, Nikhil. Yeah, we can take a look at the draft presented at city council. Um, I think I should clarify that the exemption in the model rule that has been suggested by DOER 
is specific to water heating in multifamily buildings. So a large multifamily building would have to have, you know, would have to be built with all electric equipment otherwise, including for heating. Um, it's just the water heating part. Um, you know, there's, GOAIR has suggested that could be for, you know, until the end of 2026, be built with a fossil fuel based system. Um, but again, if we choose not, we would have to justify any deviations from the model rule, including not including that exemption. Thank you. Um, next question. A lot of energy may be used for exhaust and makeup air systems in a commercial kitchen. Do the requirements for commercial kitchen exhaust hoods allow for reduced uh, CFM, so cubic feet per minute, so the amount of air that um, is being replaced for electric or induction appliances versus gas-fired appliances? So, um, I'm not entirely sure how to answer this question. Um, Nikhil, do you have a, a um, I can add some preliminary thoughts. Um, you know, I think what the question asker is referring to is that induction cooking actually creates a lot less heat in the in the room, right? So in commercial kitchens, oftentimes the temperature for kitchen workers is really hot um, because the heat is you know coming out of the stove and um, for induction cooking, there's a lot less of that. And so the question is, you know, would the code uh, be adapted? Oh, would the code sort of allow for less ventilation equipment or less powerful ventilation equipment? Um, I think that's a great question that we will pose to our research consultants working on this um, so that we can um, account for that in our, in our development of the language. Thank you, Nikhil. Next question. How are you evaluating capacity of Eversource to carry new electric loads that will result from new requirements? Um, uh, I, I think I addressed this question, but I just add the additional thought that um, Eversource are, has started doing a fairly complex um, load forecasting, meaning understanding how much electricity they need going forward. And as I noted, this is based on the, the actual regulations that is, are being proposed and an and understanding of what is likely to be built in Cambridge or renovated. So I, I think their, their ability to predict, and I would say that they always um, plan for worst case scenario, um, they have really improved their capabilities and, and their, their um, integration of the specific requirements that are being passed in Cambridge. Okay, next question. Would Cambridge consider allowing PACE financing for renovations under this plan? And I'll just uh, pause for a moment and explain to everyone here what this means. So in, in Massachusetts, um, there's a, a state, quasi-state agency called Mass Development, and that agency makes available what's called Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. That's what PACE stands for. And what, it, what that does is that um, they, they um, make available fun for, um, funds that people can, uh, uh, loan funds that people can access. And the loan is, is structured through a, your tax bill, your property tax bill your lo in Cambridge. So if you take out a PACE loan, you will be paying back your, you're making your loan payments through the city's tax bill. And the advantage of that is that a property owner can uh, have a loan that travels with the building. So uh, when the building is sold, it'll just continue, the loan payments can continue be, be on, on your tax bill. And that makes it um, more um, uh, lucrative, if you will, to have loans that may have a longer payback, even if you're deciding that you might wanna sell your building earlier. So the, the many communities in Massachusetts have already adopted um, the ability to take uh, for a property owner to access PACE funding. And it is uh, 
expected that the city council will actually also vote to adopt PACE funding in Cambridge at the August 7 meeting. So if someone uh, wants to access a PACE loan uh, to do a new building or a major building renovation, that is entirely possible. And, and we think this is a, a positive new addition to property owners' ability to finance uh, either new construction or renovation. Okay, um, we have heard that Cambridge is about maxed out with what it can electrify given the existing electric capacity. Shouldn't we wait to pass such a mandate until we have a study of electric capacity available for expansion and project, projected need for electrification in the near term? Um, I think I've, I have uh, provided an answer to this and um, certainly there's no short-term concern um, and we're, uh, Eversource has been very involved, as I've noted, in both understanding and, and predicting their ability to, to serve our needs for electrification. It will take new infrastructure to be built, electricity infrastructure to be built in Cambridge over time, but um, that, is, that is part of, of Eversource's strategy for um, being able to meet the, the new loads that are required for electrification. Uh, there's a question, why can hospital, medical offices, and laboratories have exception to the requirement? Akhil, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, that was the uh, exceptions that were defined by the, the state and actually the, by the legislature when they created this program. Um, so that's part of state law, and it's not something that an individual city can can alter. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that, Suzanne? Uh, no, I think that's. Okay. And uh, maybe you want to continue and answer the question about how is backup power how how is backup emergency power generation on site fuels oil storage treated for large commercial buildings constructed new or renovated in this demonstration program. Um, yes, that is a good question. Um, you know, there are a number of buildings in Cambridge that have critical loads that that use generators, um, or diesel backup systems, and uh, that is something that our research consultant is looking into and and kind of examining if the model rule already allows for emergency backup to be an exempted use, um, and if not, you know, if that would be an appropriate. Um, exemption for Cambridge to call out. Thank you. Um, I see another question. Have you calculated the carbon, whoops, it's moving up and down in front of me. Uh, have you calculated the carbon used to fabricate and deliver new equipment and dispose of old equipment and construction materials? As a very low user of energy, I worry that retrofit would use a lot more carbon than I use. For example, I use five to seven therm of gas per month for hot water, heat, laundry, cooking, versus Massachusetts typical of 100 to 125 therms per month. Are you prepared for, whoops, the question just disappeared. Uh, um, it looks like the rest of it was, are you prepared for the power failures that could happen when folks turn on heat and demand is exceeded? So the, 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 this, this again would only apply to new construction or major renovations. So these are situations where um, obviously new, new building materials would be used um, regardless of this requirement or not. And one of the things that, a, a parallel thing that's happening in Cambridge is that um, there is now a requirement for um, all major new construction projects to report on what's called embodied carbon, meaning the amount of energy in the building materials and the processes to produce the materials. And um, this will take effect later on this year. While um, in initially this doesn't um, address the amount of energy, it is the plan, and this is part of the net zero action plan, that as we start understanding 
how much energy embodied energy goes into new buildings or major renovations that there would start being a requirement over time to reduce that and and really um, start projects start using building materials that are have as low carb embodied carbon as possible okay um I'm not sure whether there are, it it looked like there were more questions uh, and they but I will just look at the ones that I see here in front of me and if anybody feels that a, when we get to the end a question that they posed has not been answered uh, please feel free to repost it so here's a question will the greater Cambridge energy project do to be completed in 2028 provide us with the electricity that we need for this I understood that Eversource can only build out for permitted projects. Wouldn't this add to that load? So again, um, I'll, I'll sort of try to, to answer at a higher level. Um, Eversource is, understands very well the requirements that are being put in place in Cambridge. And, and right now they're undertaking a building a brand new substation in the Kendall Square area that for the foreseeable future will be able to serve all new uh, needs for, for electricity in the Eastern part of the city. They have indicated that they um, intend to, and, and based on their projections, also need to make a major upgrade in the Alewife area and they are starting to plan for that. I think the, and, and there have obviously been a, quite a number of questions that relate to what if the electricity is not available, then how can we have these requirements? And as noted, this is, this is one of the things that is addressed in the Building Energy Use Disclosure Ordinance by saying like, if you are seeking to build a building, a fully electric building and Eversource says we cannot serve you, then you will not be held to the requirements. And that is something that can also be considered as part of this. Uh, and I don't see any more uh, comment, I mean, questions. I, I do see a comment, which I uh, think is similar to, to what I just said, that, um, the, the utility company is understanding well the, the in, increased need for electrification. And I should note that that is, of course, not only based on what's happening in Cambridge, the entire state, as Nikhil described earlier in the meeting, is on, uh, has policies to make all buildings fully electric by 2050. So on the same kind of, on the same timeline as Cambridge. and. Um, so there's, there's um, pressure overall from in the entire state for the utilities to be able to deliver sufficient uh, electricity to ensure that we can meet our climate goals and that buildings can be fully electric by 2050. And that will obviously happen over time um, as the grid um, electrical infrastructure expands. So. Um, I don't see any more questions, but um, I will um, turn it over to Nikhil or um, Jen, Jennifer, if there's anything else to add, like um, in response to the questions we've had. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. I'll just add one comment, um, which is, you know, it's important to remember that the city has, is one of the communities that has adopted the specialized stretch code. So any new buildings in, built in Cambridge are expected to be you know, very highly efficient, built with a lot of insulation, um, you know, overall sort of high performance exteriors of the buildings. Um, and so, you know, building with all electric systems is expected to be very efficient and add sort of, you know, a, uh, a minimal amount to the building's electrical load, um, 
you know, compared to what it would be using, um, you know, for, for summers during air conditioning and stuff. So, you know, it, th there's a very uh, strong baseline of energy efficiency under underlying the fossil fuel free program. Thank you, Nikhil. Anything else uh, from Jennifer or Brad? I'll just encourage people again, I've, I've linked in the QA a couple of times, the survey, and um, I know we've gotten quite a few responses from you guys, even over just the past week. So um, please feel free to to utilize that link and um, you know let us know your, your thoughts via the survey. And um, if you have any questions or thoughts that you don't think can be captured in the survey, you can always um, reach out to us. You can reach out to Brad at the, the email address on your screen, and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. And Jen, can I just add, um, for folks who might need any translation of the materials related to the slides here today, um, if you go to that same website, um, there's, a, there's a link to fill out a language preference, um, and we can work with some of our colleagues to, to get uh, translated materials over to you. And just to add to that, we are uh, seeking as much input as at all possible in this very compressed time frame. So again, please fill out the survey. Um, if you uh, have networks that you would like to share information with, we can, uh, you have the web link here. We can also supply you with flyers and uh, we have the webinar on the 24th that where we expect to cover it's very similar material for anyone who couldn't attend today. And uh, Brad is here, so please feel free to email him if uh, you're e either looking for more information or answers to questions or uh, suggestions for how we can more uh, widely distribute this information to others. And with that, um, We'd like to thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's great to have so many of you here and um, an opportunity to answer your questions. And that is it for this evening. So thanks again. Bye.